it is uh, such a thrill for me to be able to welcome Bruce Turkel, uh, a mentor and a friend. Um, Bruce is going to be talking today about three topics, uh, a messaging strategy to engage your audiences, how to understand what your customers are looking for right now, and how to rethink your business and your marketing for results in this uh, moment of crisis. Um, Bruce is a keynote speaker and author. Uh, he's also the founder of Turkel Brands and Agency. Uh, this is someone who has traveled internationally giving keynote addresses uh, for six figures, um, five figures. Uh, he's also the author of five books. He's a regular guest on Fox and CNN. The fact that he's been willing to do this for our community um, is something for, for which I'll be forever grateful. Uh, Bruce is also uh, multi-talented. He is, uh, for those of you who were on earlier and got a chance to hear, he gave a, a small harmonica uh, sermon. Perhaps we'll hear a little bit of harmonica during the presentation, but he is also a musician and he has a band called the Southbound Suspects. And then there's one other thing, and I didn't tell Bruce I was gonna do this, but Bruce um, took one of our 12 week courses to learn how to promote his keynote business um, and forgot his notebook one day in class. And uh, I had to look through it to figure out whose notebook it was. And I found this doodle. Uh, that is me. And that is an, a direct quote from me on April 29th of last year. Quote, I was an asshole to my coworkers and a bit of a douche. Uh, I was telling this story at the time about how I came to get into digital marketing and it came from uh, losing my job in journalism and having to reinvent myself. And Bruce uh, beautifully uh, captured that moment. And, and there were doodles throughout uh, of me and the other instructors and even some of the students that uh, I did get permission from him to share, but I didn't let him know I was going to do it here. So um, love having uh, Bruce uh, on the call and uh, just I'm going to hand it over to him in one moment. One last thing I'll say before we um, get started with his presentation on what now. Um, we're um, doing a survey of folks um, and, and the business climate uh, and what they're facing, what their needs are. Please fill out that survey. We also encourage you to post uh, on social media at BizHack Academy and with the hashtag BizHack. And then finally, you'll see that there is a pretty active chat going on. If you have any questions at any point, uh, I'm gonna be monitoring the chat and jumping in uh, with your questions. So feel free to send those. With that, I'm gonna now hand it over uh, to my friend and my mentor, Bruce Turkel. Thanks, Bruce. So thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. and. Uh, Hi to everybody. I have to tell you that usually when I do a presentation, I'm up on stage and somebody gets up and does a wonderful introduction and they read all the stuff I did and they make stuff up. And I always say when I'm done, you know, I appreciate that. And each time I get a nice introduction like that, I really wish my mother was in the room to hear it. Well, I'm looking on this grid of all these people and there's so many people that I see out there that I like and so many people that I love, people I've worked with. And my mom's out there too. So I was thinking, wow, she gets to hear it. And then you had to say asshole and douche. And so now I got to tell you, <laughs> I don't know that I'm so happy about that. Um, it's kind of a mixed emotion thing. But thank you all for being here. I'm absolutely thrilled. And as I said, and I even, I see your smiling faces. I see you waving at me. Hey, Kirk. Hey, Kerry. It's, it's great to have you. Hey, David. It's great to have you all out there. So, so thank you so much. Um, I have a lot of notes here today. We're gonna to do some high tech, we're gonna do some low tech because I wanna to talk to you about stuff that I think not only is really important, but can really make a difference. Let me tell you up front, I'm gonna give you absolutely no medical advice. My wife is the medical hero. She goes out and sees patients every day. She goes to hospitals, she goes to home visits. Uh, the first responders and the people who are taking care of folks, they're the real heroes here. I've heard about people talking about the fact that they are business first responders. And I just think those folks are parasites. This is an opportunity for all of us to do something important, but it's not an opportunity for us to take advantage of anyone. So what I wanna do here is give you real, true ideas, advice, tools, tips, and techniques that you can use 
to um, improve your business. The first thing I want you to think about is this ostrich. Think about an ostrich with his head in the ground. Now, if you wanted to get this ostrich out, what would you do? You could probably yank on it. You could probably kick it. You could probably try to convince it to come out. But the truth is, the ostrich doesn't really care very much about you or what you do. In fact, the best way to get the ostrich out is probably to get a big bowl of ostrich food and put it next to the ostrich's head and then walk away and let the ostrich come out when it's ready. This ostrich is your customer. It's your client. It's your consumer. It's your community. It's your buyer. It's whomever you sell to. Right now, they don't care about you. They don't care about your business. They care about themselves. Now, the truth is, they always cared about themselves. They never actually cared about you. They only cared about you if they understood how you made their lives better. They don't care about you at all. But now with what's going on, that has been exacerbated. They can't go outside. They can't do the things they used to do. So your relevance to them has become less and less and less important. And the way to thrive is to understand that and understand that you have to stop thinking like a person who provides goods and services and you have to start thinking like your customer. I wanna ask you a question. I was talking to my buddy, Will, who I believe is online here and is a genius of direct marketing. And Will asked me a question. Will said to me, do you like junk mail? And I said, no, I hate junk mail. I wanna ask you that same question. How many of y'all like junk mail? If you like it, just put your hand up. I can see a lot of you. I can't see all of you. Okay, from the screen I'm looking at, one hand went up. So that means that a lot of you don't like junk mail. But here the truth is, that Will did a piece and it cost him $5,000 to send it out and it generated $400,000 in business response. It's a pretty good uh, multiple, something I think we'd all be proud of. The lesson there is that the junk mail doesn't care what you think of it and the people who responded don't care what you think of it. They responded and they purchased. All the rest of the people who hate junk mail, we have to stop caring about them. What we need to do right now, right now, Wednesday morning, is stop worrying and start planning. Because the virus doesn't care about you and what you think. The virus doesn't care about government and what government thinks. The virus doesn't care about red versus blue. They don't care about political um, positioning. They doesn't care about anything. And your customers don't either. Alan Watts, the English author, said once, no amount of anxiety makes any difference to anything that is going to happen. So you can continue to worry, you can continue to feel anxious, you can continue to stress, or you can start planning. And I would suggest that the number one thing you do for planning is to discover how not to be hurt or even care about other people's responses, opinions, ideas or thoughts about your marketing. Only care about the people who respond. I'm not suggesting you do that in your private life, although it might be useful if you're someone who cares too much about what other people think. But I am suggesting that when it comes to marketing, when it comes to building your brand, stop listening to what everybody is saying. Stop listening to what everybody is writing. Stop watching what everybody is doing and start thinking about your customer, your consumer, your client. The title of my last book is All About Them. That title was written like that for a reason, because as you build your business for this brave new world, the key is to start thinking about your buyers. What are they thinking? And more importantly, what are they feeling? So let's talk a little bit about feeling. I'm no expert in this area. My mother is the therapist and social worker, and she is, uh, but she's not on the screen, so you're going to have to listen to me. But if you've read uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who wrote on grief and, and uh, grieving, she wrote the book on how people process grief and problems. And she had a series of steps, denial, anger, bargaining, despair, and acceptance. 
And she says that people go through those steps, denying what happened, being angry about what's happening, bargaining with either whatever you believe in about what's going to happen, despairing, and then at some point accepting. Accepting doesn't mean you're happy about it, but accepting. She also points out that some people don't go through all those steps. Some people go through them in different orders. Some people go back and forth. But the idea is that people grieve in a systematic way. And these are the basics of our grieving process. Well, Alan Weiss, who writes about business all the time, he wrote about the cycle. Alan Weiss said, there is shock and disbelief. I think that's pretty clear where we are right now, shock and disbelief. And then we move into acceptance and surrender. Acceptance being, okay, I accept what's going on. And surrender meaning, okay, I'm going to do what it takes. Many of us are sheltering in place, but there's also people who still aren't. They're moving into that stage. And then he says there's a stage of recovery. And then the stage of new successes or failures. And the big question is, how do we move with our customers through those phases, but wind up in a place where after whatever recovery occurs, we have new successes and we are not the ones suffering the new failures. The biggest tragedy of all, other than the deaths and the medical, remember that's not my expertise, the biggest business tragedy of all, people just give up. There's nothing we can do. We're not allowed out of the house. My customers are not gonna buy. Revenue has stopped and they just give up. And I want you to just be clear about the troubles people have gone through in this century, the last century, much more severe than what we're going through right now. And Charlie Chaplin, who of course we know made all those great movies during World War II, Charlie Chaplin said, nothing is permanent, not even our troubles. So the question has to be then, if we accept that, what are we going to do to move forward? And it should be of no surprise to you that the person who wrote a book called All About Them would have a strategy that is completely customer-based. Because if you're going to move forward, if people are now in these stages of grief, if in fact it doesn't really matter what you think, it matters what your buyer thinks, then why don't we try to understand the buyer? So the Harvard Business Review wrote an article after the 2008 recession, and they talked about four kinds of buyers. By the way, we are going to, um, Dan and I are going to create a, a one-sheeter. We're going to send this out. You're welcome, of course, to copy this. You're welcome to take pictures of it, uh, screenshots. I also wrote a blog post about this about, I don't know, sometime last week, which you can very easily find. My blog is just my name, BruceTurkel.com. And you can, of course, click on the blog section and you'll find a whole document about this. Uh, but there's four kinds of consumers they talked about. Number one, the slam on the brake consumers. You all know them. Those are the folks who say nothing. We're doing nothing. Those are, let's face it, the ostriches. The heads go plunk into the ground, metaphorically and perhaps actually, and they do nothing. They slam on the brakes. We are in a terrible time and things stop. Then next they talk about the pain but patient buyers. Those are folks who see what's going on. They're suffering, they're suffering in lots of different ways. And they understand that life goes on, but they can wait. They don't have to rush out and buy things. They don't have to rush out and do things. They tend to be resilient and optimistic, but they're concerned about their standard of living. They economize in all areas, but much less aggressively than the slam on the brakes consumers who economize on everything. The third group are the ones who are comfortably well off. So they feel secure about their ability to make ends meet. They have assets. They perhaps don't have debt. They might be in jobs that continue to generate income, but they also understand that there's a current and future crisis and they realize that they need to purchase more selectively. And also they want to be less conspicuous about their purchasing because nobody wants to be the person on the street buying the big things that no one else can afford. You saw what just happened when David Geffen 
took that photograph of himself in the grenadines on his giant yacht and said, hey, I am sheltering in place. Hope you all are too. And he just got flamed online because it was a rather insecure, uh, insensitive thing to do. It was also insecure, but it was rather insensitive. And finally, we have the live for today consumers. Those are the YOLO guys. You only live once. Those are the idiots who are on the beach partying. Those are the people who are making believe that nothing has happened. Now, if you remember what we said a minute ago, that uh, you have to stop caring about what, what the consumers think of you, you also have to stop caring about the consumers who are not going to buy from you. So if I take my big red pen, the slam on the brakes, guys, they are not your customers. They're not going to be buying from you right now. They're slamming on the brakes. The live for today people, well, they might actually be buying from you, but they're buying from you just the way they used to. There's nothing you need to do to go after them either. You just have to exist. The people you want to pay attention to are these two groups in the middle, the pained but patient and the comfortable. Because these are the folks who understand that life goes on. And so now we need to reconfigure our offerings for them. We need to understand that they're the people who are going to be helping us move into the brave new world because they're the people who are going to continue to purchase, continue to look for you for goods and services, for products, for help. They have lives. They need to be dealing with folks like you who can make their lives better. So that then leads us to the next step, which is if we understand who our buyers are, then we have to talk about what it is we're selling them. By the way, let me jump back for one moment. A good way to deal with this is to think of yourself. Think of where you fit within these categories. I know that I toggle back and forth between two of them but it also allows me to start painting an avatar of who my buyers are and where they fit within this continuum and how I can best reach out to them. So then the question becomes, what am I going to offer them? Well, lucky for us, Harvard Business Review also talked to us about products and services. And they divided those things up into four categories. The first, first category, essentials. Um, obviously, those are things like food and medicine. But be careful because essentials mean different things to different people. In the 2008 recession, one thing that was very odd was that people uh, did not pay their mortgages but attendance to sporting events did not drop off. Well, that suggests then that a lot of people consider going to see a ball game an essential in their lives, and they didn't think that paying their mortgage was an essential in their life. You can think of your own life. You might think going and getting your hair colored is an essential. Clearly that doesn't matter to me, but it might matter to some of you. You can think of having your yard person show up being essential. It's not just the obvious things, but the essentials clearly are the things that people are going to keep buying. And let me suggest that you don't look at what the government considers essential industries to determine what essentials are. A, we know that that's done based on political considerations. And B, the consumers of political messaging are not necessarily your buyers. So what you have to look at is of your products, what are your essentials? Secondly, there are treats. And treats are indulgences but the types of indulgences where the purchase is considered justifiable. So perhaps those tickets to go see ball games were not actually essentials, but they were treats. We knew that they were indulgent, but we were willing to spend the money. It's possible that buying your dog dog food is an essential, but dying, buying all the little treats they like is in fact a treat. Remember that your customers, your buyers, make these decisions. You don't. Uh, the third, are postponables. Postponables are the things that people will continue to buy, but they don't have to buy right now. Something that's made the fascinating jump from essential to postponable, toilet paper. You remember everybody rushed out two weeks ago and bought every roll of toilet paper in the store. 
I don't know if it's because people thought toilet paper is made in China or because they were worried that COVID was actually a gastrointestinal virus, but they bought all the toilet paper. Guess what? Now it's a postponable because people have closets full of it. So you need to be really aware of what of your products and services are still viable products, but maybe not now. And of course, then that leads to expendables. And expendables are simply no longer justifiable. Will they be justifiable in the future? That remains to be seen. You don't need to get rid of them. You don't need to stop offering them. You certainly don't need to give up your licensing or get rid of your inventory or whatever it is. However, you do need to consider that the expendables are not worth marketing. They're not worth promoting. They are not worth talking to your buyers about because in fact, they are expendable. So if you accept all of this, if you say, okay, I know who my buyers are, they're in those four categories. I know who I'm going after, two categories, or maybe the YOLOs, the, if they're still in your, in your consideration set. And then you know what products and services you offer and which of them fall into which of these categories. Then the question becomes, what do you do next? And here's where things start to get very interesting because the first thing you need to do is assess your opportunities. You need to look at which of your products, your services are going to live and which of them are going to die. I am in the uh, speaking business. You heard Dan talk about that. Up until a few weeks ago, I was traveling all over the world speaking at conferences, groups of people, 300, 400, 500, two, 3,000, and talking to them about building their brands. And I'm in a number of groups and a number of these webinars with other speakers. And I think it's pretty safe to say that at, at least for the midterm, the speaking and conferencing business in person, getting up on stage with 500 people in a room at a hotel, that business is over. Will it come back? Remains to be seen. But for the time being, that business is dead. And so I have to think about not even worrying about continuing to sell that service because who the hell is going to buy it? Nobody is going to be, able, even if they want it. Other businesses you can think of that are going to die, at least in the short term or midterm. Shopping centers. Who's going to go to a shopping center? First of all, we don't need to be around other people. Second of all, for the most part, between Amazon and the other online purveyors, we can buy whatever we want. I mentioned this to my buddy Will this morning, and he said the shopping centers that will prevail are the ones that provide services where you have to actually go out and get something done. Like uh, the companies that fix our phones, for example, we all drop our cell phones, they need to be fixed. But then you wonder, are we gonna go to shopping centers for that? Or will the guy be in one of those big sprinter vans and just show up at your front door? You sure as hell won't let him in your house, but you might walk out there, hand him your phone, wait while he fixes it and brings it back. Dog grooming, those sort of things. Those businesses, the service portion is gonna stay uh, viable. However, the way it's delivered, the distribution vehicle is going to change. How about gyms? We all need to continue to exercise and work out, but who the hell is gonna go into a dirty, sweaty room with equipment that everyone else touched? And I don't know about you, but in all the gyms I've been to, I've never found one that was particularly clean and inviting where I would actually have a meal on the bench. So physical trainers are probably not gonna go away. But the actual physical gym, well, you could be pretty sure that those are going away. So the first question is, what businesses, there's just no point in dealing with them right now. The second point is, in assessment, is businesses that can be stabilized. How can you take what you offer and how can you stabilize it? So in fact, I can't go speak at conferences around the world, but maybe I can do online webinars. Maybe people will want to be on Zoom and on, uh, on WebEx and on the other platforms. And maybe there's a way I can stabilize that business. Will it be the same as it was before? Of course not. Will it be as profitable and as valuable as it was before? I don't think so. However, it can be stabilized. And then the third part is, what of your products or services can flourish? And before you say, oh, nothing's gonna flourish, look what's going on. Wouldn't you like to own stock in Amazon right now? How about Zoom? 
How about Postmates? By the way, my wife has been telling me to buy Zoom stock for about three weeks now. So this is my mea culpa right here. Um, how, about, how about Postmates? How about Instacart? There's plenty of businesses that are thriving. There's plenty of ways you can flourish. I don't know what your way is. I don't even know what my way is at this point, but we need to be looking for it. But while we're doing that, you need to look at point two, which is plan for the long term, because things are going to come back. They're not gonna come back the way they were. Business as usual is now going to be business as unusual. The new normal will become the normal, but business will still exist. And so therefore, you need to continue to build your brand and you need to continue to demonstrate the value that you offer your customers. This might be actually the best opportunity for you to show what your brand is about. If you lived here in South Florida, you would be getting emails from the restaurants around town talking about how they deliver, they'll bring food to you. Two of them that stuck out in my mind for doing this were John Martin's and Talavera. John Martin's is an Irish pub. So John Martin's has been sending out mailers every day that said, remember, we deliver. Every restaurant can say that, right? But they're an Irish pub. So they say, remember, we deliver food and alcohol. Ah, right, Irish pub. Let's face it, why do you go to an Irish pub? You go to an Irish pub to drink. So they understand who their buyer is and they understand what their specialty is and they promote it. Talavera is a Mexican restaurant. So they have a new system where they have vans that go into neighborhoods and you can come out to the van and they, you can buy what you want from the van and the person in the van has a mask and has gloves and is wearing white. So they're promoting their sanitary measures, but all restaurants can do that. But they add one more thing. They have all the foods you like, the, the tacos and the burritos and the guacamole, but they also talk about their vegetarian offerings. Because let's face it, if you're a vegetarian, you spend a lot of time in Thai restaurants and you spend a lot of time in Mexican restaurants. These two companies that do exactly the same thing, they sell food and they sell drinks, understand that what they need to do is build their brand. I think of Mexican restaurants for vegetarian food. I think of Irish pubs for drinking and that's what they're doing. You need to track your audience. If in fact, it's all about them, if in fact your audience is what matters more than anything, then you need to be paying attention to them. You need to be watching, excuse me, you need to be watching what they're doing and what they're saying. You need to understand who they are and why they matter and you need to act accordingly. And then finally, you need to balance your budget. You can't stop spending, but you can't spend yourself into oblivion. You can't spend yourself into irrelevance because you don't know what's going to work. So what you need to do is get very careful about testing. How do you do that? Well, one of the great ways to do it is through um, Dan's program at BizHack. This is not a paid ad. He didn't ask me to do this, but I took the BizHack class because I wanted to understand how can I sell online and how can I track, <clears throat> excuse me, how can I track who is watching my videos, reading my blog posts and reaching out to me. So understanding that right now is very, very important. The other thing you can do is start marketing to your community. So I, I write a blog. I used to write it every week. These days I'm writing it every two or three days. And I have a blog list with a lot of people on it and I'm communicating with them all the time. But I'm also watching what they're saying. By the way, anybody who wants the blog, it's just my name, BruceTurkel.com. Hit blog, there's a little sign up sheet or you can just send me your email. My email is the same thing. This is bruce at brucetrickell.com. Very easy to get to. So um, we can do that together. But the idea is we need to pay attention to the folks who are buying from us and maybe even more importantly, the folks who are not buying from us yet. Potential customers are the ones we should be paying attention to. We need to prepare for this shift in consumer values, and consumer attitudes. As I said, business as usual is going to become business as unusual. The new normal 
is going to become the new normal. But at the same time, here's a really weird dichotomy. Everything's gonna change except us. We have not changed as human beings in a million years since we were hunter-gatherers on the Great Savannah. Evolution happens very, very slowly. So we're gonna change the way we wanna buy things, but we're not gonna change the way we respond to, to offers that make us feel better. In fact, I see here that um, um, Kate Boyer asked if comfort is an essential need. I don't know if it's essential or not. What I do know is that in each one of those four buyer categories, they define comfort differently and they're going to be looking for comfort. I mean, who needs comfort more now, whether it's comfort food, whether it's the hugs you can't have, whether it's the visits you can't have, all of those basic human concerns are not going to change. People are still gonna be looking for things that make them feel better. Here's the most important thing. I say this in every single one of my Marketing Minute videos. I say this to every one of my audiences. A good brand makes people feel good, but a great brand makes people feel good about themselves. And if you can do that with the products that you offer, with the services that you offer, with the ways that you reach out to people, then you're going to be able to get people to pay attention because that is the ultimate comfort, isn't it? Feeling good about ourselves. Understanding all of that, I really wanna make sure that everybody on this screen that I'm looking at, all these beautiful faces, stop talking about when things get back to normal. First of all, they're not gonna get back to normal. Second of all, it's gonna take a long time, a lot longer than anybody's telling us. And third of all, listen to this quote from Vivian Green. Life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. That's what we all need to do. We need to work together. We need to share our skill sets. We need to share our talents. We need to share the music that we all play so that we can all dance in the rain because we're all hunter gatherers waiting for things to get better. My friend Will, who I talked to you about earlier, he told me that he studied successful people. He read over 300 books on successful people. And he said the secret to successful people is that they embrace change. They are adaptable and flexible. They actually understand what's happening, not in the world, but with their customers, and they look for ways to make better responses. My friend Robert Mazzucchelli, who was uh, trying to become a pro tennis player and ultimately had to change his life, he said that the key to playing tennis is not your ability to hit the ball or run around the court. That's cost of entry. That's the ante to playing the game. He says, if you want to be great at tennis, you have to learn to love problems. Because he says the key to tennis is to provide your opponent with more problems they can't solve than they provide you with. And if you think about that for a minute, it makes perfect sense. They're gonna give you a problem. They're gonna hit the ball really hard. If you can respond to that problem and give them a bigger problem, make them run to the back of the court, that's how you win the game. And my friend and mentor, Susan Ford Collins, who wrote the book, The Joy of Success, and she also tracked successful people, interviewed them and wrote books on it. She also talks about the fact that successful people understand how to pivot. They have their little pity party, they deal with whatever problems they have, and then they figure out what they need to do next, what they need to do to change. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some of those things, but before we do, I thought I should answer some questions because I see a bunch of questions popping up here. Um, uh, Nancy Samet of the TY Group, she wants to know about new strategies for marketing during the current envi environment and then for what to do when the economy starts again. Well, I think we talked about what to do in the current environment, haven't we? You need, the strategy needs to be understand who your customer is today. I don't care who your customer was before and understand what is essential and what are treats. Remember, things that are enjoyable yet justifiable and figure out how you can create a message 
that offers essential, justifiable treats to the people who have the money and the need to buy from you. Um, Irene Fernandez, how can I be consistent and still being, and, and build my brand while still being respectful of the situation? I love that question because I think that's exactly what you need to do. What do they say in the uh, old Kung Fu movies? The answer is in the question. That is the answer. Be respectful and be consistent. People know you for something. You exist successfully for a reason. Now's not the time to change that. Now's the time to double down on who you are and why you matter. But remember, now is the time to do it from your customer's point of view, not from your own. As far as being respectful, we all know how to do that. You were taught how to be respectful in kindergarten. Share your crayons, take a nap in the afternoon, say please and thank you. It's not difficult. We already know who's looking smarmy. We already know who's looking like an opportunist. You don't need my help with that. Your mom taught you how to do that when you were a little kid. <clears throat> you just need to remember it. Um, Mario from Mendelssohn Consulting wants ideas and methods to put the word out about our service offerings to address the growing needs of remote work environments. Well, here's something very interesting. I've heard a lot of people talk about remote environments and I know people who are now teaching courses on how to be on Zoom. May I make one suggestion? If you're using a Mac, use Photo Booth. If you're using a PC, use the appropriate software that lets you look at your screen and take a look, not at yourself, but at what people see behind you. In Zoom, you can do it. You can click in, on your picture and then it says pin video and it'll put your video on the full screen and look at the environment that's behind you. That's how people judge you. I was in one of these meetings, pardon me for being rude, but this is what happened. And it was in somebody's home office and they had those louvered closet doors behind them. And there was a, a bra hanging over the louvered closet, closet door. The door was white, the bra was black. It was pretty clear what it was. By the way, the person I was having the meeting with was a man, which made it even weirder. You know, it doesn't take that much thought to figure that out. If I could be even a little grosser here, but we can all use a laugh and I'm gonna use my knuckle, let me be clear. I was in another one of these Zoom meetings and one of the people in the window was doing this. Cause I think they forgot, there's a camera on. And I didn't know what to do. Do I find my phone and text him? Do I go in the chat and say, <laughs> I mean, do I take bets? Hey, is he, what, is he gonna look at it when he, I mean, I was completely flabbergasted. You don't have to be a genius to figure that out. What you have to think about is your customer's point of view. Um, Dave Bricker just wrote a book on how to do Zoom meetings. It's an amazing book. I don't know how he wrote it so quickly. You can find it on Facebook. Uh, if you can't find it, send me an email and I'll be happy to send you the link. He was also in the class, uh, in Dan's class at BizHack. Dave Bricker is his name, B-R-I-C-K-E-R. It's something about uh, shooting video out of the box or something. I forget the title, I'm sorry, but it's a great book and it'll tell you exactly what to do, how to do backdrops, how to do lighting, how to set up your microphone, all those things. Hopefully I'm doing it properly um, and I would recommend that all of you do it as well. Keith Spurlock is asking, what do you need to do when no one can use your services at this time? That's a big problem. That gets back to my problem of not being able to travel around the world speaking at conferences. So you can use this time to do your inventory. I used it to finish my next book, which is called, Is That All There Is? And it's about pivoting, which has turned out to be incredibly timely. Um, you can use that time to figure out how else to reach out to your customers. You can figure out new strategies. I don't specifically know what a photographer should do right now, but I do know that there's going to be lots of opportunities. For example, if we're all doing these Zoom calls, if we're all using social media, shouldn't we have better headshots? I mean, you know the old saying for online dating, don't send your photo and show up 20 years later. So maybe it's the, thank you, Gene, I appreciate somebody laughing. I love having your, you right in front on the grid. Thank you. Thumbs up to you too. Um, maybe now's the perfect time for a photographer if you can figure out a way that someone will let you get close enough to him to take the picture. Or maybe now, all those expensive, really long lenses you have 
are good because you can do the shot from um, 30 feet away. I don't know. But I think all the things we went through are exactly what you need to do. The uh, product to use your quote, services no one can use, those are the services that are gonna go away, at least for the short term. And so instead, we need to look at what we can do for the long term. Okay, John Kelly wants to know, how do you write a book? John, it's easy. A page a day is a book a year. You sit down at the typewriter, or I'm sorry, the keyboard, and you do this. That's it. People say to me all the time, you know, you've written six, seven books. I have a book inside me. I go, good, you need to get it out because it's really dark in there and no one can see. <laughs> Just write it. If you're waiting for inspiration, you're not a writer, you're a waiter. And right now, as we know, nobody can go to restaurants. So being a waiter is not a good thing. Now's the perfect time. Just start writing. That's how you write a book. Uh, Dan, you wanted to do some housekeeping before I finish up? Yeah, um, well, one thing is uh, Louis Brunicardi uh, had a question. I texted it to you about tourism and hospitality industries. Uh, here we go. How do, you, how do I consider those might adapt? So, Luis, I will tell you that I spent most of my career with my partner, Kirk, who I see is online here. We worked in the travel and tourism industry. Um, we spent most of our time figuring out how to get people to move to different, not move, travel to different communities. It's a big issue. Um, I think right now it's going to be offering services to healthcare companies. If you want to know how to do it for midterm or long term, I can tell you because my friends and in Mexico at the uh, Gran Velas hotels, they're clients of mine, and I think they're doing something beautiful. They are sending out emails to their customers, their visitors, offering their core services. So they know who their customers are. They've kept very, very careful databases. So for their customers who have young children and they've put their children in the kids club at their hotels, they have been sending daily videos of activities for the kids to do. Games they can do, they're doing Spanish classes, they're doing all of the things that parents need for their kids because let's face it, parents of small children are going insane because their kids are in the house. Um, they know which of those families have teenage kids because they enrolled them in those programs. So they're doing classes for teenagers on how to use TikTok, how to create video, how to do social media, Spanish classes as well. They're doing, um, they're having their masseuses show you how to do self massage, no snickering please. And they're having their, um, they're having their coaches, their trainers lead online courses, Zumba type courses, uh, um, all sorts of, uh, you know, different kinds of exercise programs. But the most beautiful thing I think they did was they had their um, chefs, they have 25 chefs, two of whom are Michelin two-star chefs. They have them on standby and they tell people, send us the inventory of what you have in your pantry. Send us if you have any problems, uh, gluten intolerance, or you keep, you keep uh, your vegetarian or you keep kosher or whatever your needs are. And we will send you back recipes based on what you have in your pantry and in your refrigerator. Does that put people in their hotel rooms tomorrow? No, it doesn't. But let's be honest, who's gonna go to Cabo or Acapulco or Puerto Vallarta or Cancun right now and stay in one of their hotels? Nobody. However, who's gonna feel really good about the company that not only reached out to me with videos and saying, hey, we hope you're okay, but said to me, send me the stuff in your pantry and your refrigerator and I'll show you how to make healthy nutritious meals for your family, I would want to go back to that hotel just to meet that chef and hug them and thank them once I could get, you know, physically close enough to them. I think there are a lot of ways to take your core attributes, your key essence, and give it to your customers. If I had more time, I would talk to you about what I call the, the, the key formula to this, which is CC to CC. Company centric, company being you, to TO, consumer centric. How do you take who you are and what you do and how do you give it to your customer? So, in the case of Grand Velas, they produce these amazing meals. They're giving that to their customer. If a hotel is known for relaxation, 
they should be giving you, maybe you just put a, a webcam on the beach and say, look, we know you can't be here, but here's a beautiful thing you can put on your, um, on your screen when you need to relax. Each one of us can promote our key benefits, our key attributes, our key essence. But remember, it's not, you're not that little obnoxious kid on the high diving board. Hey, look at me, look what I can do, look at me. But instead, you're saying, here's how what I do can make you feel better. Luis, you happen to be right up top on my grid, so you can nod. Did that answer your question? Yes, I got a thumbs up, very good. Okay, hey Dan, I told you I would be on time. It's on time for you. All right, sounds good. And uh, we had a couple other questions. You, uh, one from Callie and, and another from Jonathan Miller, if you wanna take a look at those. Um, I wanted to take a minute, guys, and just do uh, a little bit of uh, housekeeping with you, talk about some um, next steps uh, from here, uh, as well as some upcoming things we have for you. Um, and we'll wrap up at 1.30. I'm going to give uh, Bruce back the floor to uh, kind of wrap up in style as he does so well. First, all of you guys who are on the call today, uh, you'll get these resources in your inbox. Uh, we've compiled uh, tips and tools for business owners who want to market during COVID-19. Uh, we're going to have a, a list of digital marketing resources for small businesses. Both Facebook and Google are offering very large grants uh, to small businesses. Uh, there's also a, a list from the County of Local Business and Nonprofit Disaster Relief, uh, which is great to look at. We're going to have a, a worksheet on tools for teleworking and remote work, some of our recommended software, and uh, a recording of last week's webinar, which was a panel discussion uh, with several business owners about how they're adapting. We will also have a recording of today's webinar, which will be shared uh, on social media and via email. I know a few of you um, came a little late and you'll be able to uh, uh, see the full webinar there. Next week at this time, we're gonna be talking about mindfulness, leadership, and resilience with startup coach, corporate mindfulness trainer, and radio host, Suzanne Jewell. She's also another BizHack alum and just an amazing talent. Uh, don't miss that. Uh, BizHack's 12-week program is starting in April. Uh, there's a link to the syllabus and where to apply. So if you feel like you want to learn better how to do this, uh, how to generate online leads. This is a great program. It's an entirely online program uh, with a lot of community and one-on-one -on -one coaching built in. And uh, I put this up last week and I think it's just such a great um, statement of the times, but the characters in Chinese for crisis are the combination of danger and opportunity. Um, and I think that there is, uh, if there ever were a moment where you can see the incredible wisdom in that, uh, there's tremendous danger for us as business owners, as we're losing clients, as we or in our uh, employees and our um, customers are getting sick. Uh, there, there's also opportunity. A lot of businesses right now are ill-prepared for this new business environment. They're not uh, savvy about how to communicate with their customers. If you follow the precepts that Bruce talked about, uh, you are going to be able to get out of this crisis the opportunity. So um, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Bruce, to take us home, but I just wanted to say, this is a hard time for all of us. We're all feeling anxious. Focus on the opportunity as best you can, uh, and BizHack Academy uh, will be there for you. Like and share and follow us. Uh, and we will uh, continue to create programming like this for the community uh, to help you and to also just see beautiful, friendly faces. Uh, back to you, Bruce. Thanks, Dan. I, that was great. I got to scroll through uh, the questions. So I've written a few. I'm going to try to answer them very quickly. I may go a couple minutes over time. I hope you all don't mind. Uh, Melissa recommended about writing a book, the book Bird by Bird. It's a fabulous book. I loved reading it. Besides being full of great information, it's wonderful to read. So if you haven't read, if you're interested in writing a book and you haven't read Bird by Bird, I absolutely agree with Melissa. And thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, my buddy Tim Ravenna asked about arts communities. And I think there's one very simple answer, Tim. If you're sitting at home sheltering in place, imagine what sheltering in place would be like without art. If you had 
nothing to watch, nothing to read, nothing to listen to, music, dance, movies, paintings, poetry, whatever it is that turns you on, that's all what the arts community provides. So I think this is a great opportunity for the arts community to demonstrate value. Sure, it's lovely to have an expensive this or an expensive that. It's lovely to have great office buildings and everything else, but right now, sitting at home in my living room, it's all about the arts. And I think now is a great opportunity to sell that. Um, Jonathan Miller put up a great response about traveling. And he said that one of the things Luis and others should look at in the industry is what businesses are traveling right now. And that goes back to that chart about what's essential, what's uh, expendable. There are industries where travel is essential. And so look to see who they are and market directly to them. I'd be happy to help with that some more if you like, because I think that's fascinating. And Callie asked, Callie Bell asked about pricing how to price during these times. Um, that's a big issue because for example, I'll use myself as an example. When I speak at these conferences, I have a, a pretty hefty fee for going to, try to speak. And often people try to get my fee down. And if it's a local event, they used to say, well, you don't have to travel anymore. So we should charge you, you should charge less. And I always ask them, hey, are you paying me to travel? Or are you paying me for my ability to enlighten, educate, and entertain your audiences. Understand what it is you're selling. That being said, now that I'm doing some of these things on webinars and Zoom calls and whatnot, clients are even less likely to pay my full fee. And there's a lot of people who need what I'm offering. And Callie, there's a lot of people who need what you're offering. So I've created a new program. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share the screen if y'all don't mind for a moment. I hope I don't screw this up. Um, and you are welcome to have this piece of art. I will happily share it with you. You can use it, you can modify it. There's no, I, I don't want any copyright on it. Uh, maybe Tim could take it and redesign it and make it look better. But uh, this is the program I now have when I talk about pricing. So let's share this. And I tell them quite simply, I'll do it for my fee or I'll do it for free. What works for you right now? Will somebody take advantage who could afford to pay and yet doesn't pay? Absolutely. I don't care. I want to help. I want to be in the game. I want to participate. I want to build my brand. If someone needs what I do and they can't afford to pay for it, I'll figure out a way to get it done for them for less money. If they can't afford to pay for it, then I'd like them to pay. What this does do though, Callie, is it stops them from needing to, um, needing to negotiate on the actual fee. It doesn't say fee discount or free. So either pay my fee or I'll do it for nothing. But I am not interested in, in discounting because the quality of what I offer is not discounting regardless of how you get it. Anyways, if you want that artwork, you're welcome to it. I'll either post it on my website or I'll make it available. Dan will make it available. We'll give it to you. The key is you can have what I do. I don't discount because the, the value of what I've done does not go down. I'm just willing to offer you a scholarship if you want. I hope that answered your question. Dave Kleiman, uh, or Cl I, mean, I think that's how he pronounces it, said that he's offered his longtime clients his services uh, for free during the crisis, which he said has gone a long way towards goodwill for the long term. Dave Klein is one of my favorite people in the world and also one of my mentors. He taught me both the travel space and he's the reason why my speaking fee is so high because when I told him what it was, he said to me, what? When I told him what it was originally, are you crazy? You should charge three times that. Okay, I have to admit, I didn't go up to three times, but I did go up to about two and a half times, David. Thank you very much. I owe all of that to you. I love you. Thank you. I'm so glad you're on. Um, I have to scroll around to see, oh, there you are, sitting in front of your beautiful farmland. I'm waving back at you. Okay, so I have one more quick point to give you all. Um, my previous book, Building Brand Value, listed seven points you need to build a brand. And these points have not changed. Now, we're not gonna take all the time to go through this, but if you go on my website, it's all there. You can have it. I'm happy to share it with you. But let me just show you what they are.
These are the seven things you need to do to build your brand. They work in good times, they work in bad times. Number one, we've talked about it the entire morning. It's what I wrote my last book on. All them. Stop thinking about yourself, stop thinking about your problems, stop thinking about your issues, start thinking about your buyer. Number two, hearts then minds. It's time to make an emotional connection with your buyer, not an intellectual connection. You want proof? Raise hands. I can't see all of you, but I can see some of you. How many of you all have heard the term COVID-19? Every single one of us, right? Has anyone not heard that term? Has anyone not used it? Does anybody know what it stands for? What it means? Yeah, I didn't think so. I didn't either. I had to look it up. COVID-19 is CO, Corona, VI, virus, D, disease, 19, 2019. COVID-19, the intellectual understanding of the word is, is coronavirus 2019. None of us know that. We're terrified of it. We talk about it. We write about it. We use it. But we didn't even know what it was. Because the intellectual response is not what makes us respond. It's the emotional response. Hearts, then minds. Why what David Kleiman does is so brilliant. He's building an emotional connection with his consumer, with his customer. I'm there for you, he says. If you're a customer of mine, I'm not charging you because I care about you. Not because later on you'll do something for me. Hearts, then minds. Number three, make it simple. Each one of you should be able to describe what you do in one, two, or three words. Not based on the function of what you do, but what you do for your customer. I make my customers' brands more valuable. That's it. That's what I do. Each one of you should be able to do that. Make it simple. Make it quick. And then point five. Okay, see, that was a joke. I said make it quick, and then I jumped ahead, you see? <laughs> make it what, the way you describe who you are, what you do, and why you matter. you got to make it quick, and then make it yours. What do you own? The people who I see on right now that I know, Tim and I, David and now Callie and Sue Romanos and, and um, Dan, I know what you do. You own your space. Vic Coppola, hello Vic. I know what Vic does. He owns his space. Each one of you has to do the same thing. Point six, all five senses. Make sure that your message is not just something people read or something people hear, but something they smell, taste, and touch. It might be virtual right now since we can't actually smell, taste, and touch other people right now, but you can still use sensual language in your description. And finally, point seven, repeat, repeat, repeat. Once you know who you are, what you do, what you offer your buyer, and what it is they want, you say it over and over and over and over and over again, which ironically does not give you the right to be repetitive. You have to come up with new creative ways to do it. That's what keeps Kirk Kaplan and Tim Ravenna in business, coming up with new creative ways to say the same old thing. I want to tell you one very quick story and then I'm saying goodbye. I was in LA last week. Uh, I had a, I, my last speaking gig was in LA. My daughter lives there, so I got to spend time with her. And I had dinner with a friend of mine. And he said to me, he's uh, uh, 10 years older than I am. He's ready to retire. He said to me that he had converted half of his retirement income to cash. I said, wow, that was brilliant. How did you know to do that? He said, well, I've been reading the papers, I've been watching, and I thought something was going to happen and I better do it. I said, that's great. When did you do it? He said, this morning. At which point, thank you, David, I made that same face. I was like that emoji, right? What that means is that he lost 25% of the value of half of his corpus, of half of his assets, like that. There was nothing I could say, so I changed the subject. However, my parting advice to all of you is to treat your face, your 401k, your IRA the same way. Don't touch them.
Thank you all very much. I really love doing this. I love looking at all your smiling faces. And if I can be helpful, you know how to find me. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, am I my daughter here with me? You want to say thank you, Iris? Hi, Iris. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for coming out today. Please spread the word about these. If we can keep getting big crowds, we'll keep getting them uh, out there for you. And if you know of anybody uh, who you think uh, would be a great guest, uh, please let us know. Bruce, thanks again. Uh, can't thank you enough. You've been uh, such a great mentor and friend for me all these years. Uh, and thanks for the giving your time today. Um, it, it was certainly wor uh, words that um, deserve to be paid for, but thank you for offering them for free to the community. Free or fee. You